Once again, I would like to welcome all of you to this public forum titled Leaving No One Behind, Bringing Positive Changes to People's Lives Under the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so I'm rather excited to get this conversation going, especially with these four young, vibrant change makers who have impacted the people and um, the communities around them. So we have today um, Ramya Gopal, who is the executive assistant from Project Liberate. I will uh, leave it to her to introduce Project Liberate and tell, tell us what Project Liberate is about. We have Juliana Adam from a, a, a very vibrant Malaysian social enterprise known as BGBG Initiative. She is the CEO. We have Radhika, our very own um, uh, Monash alumni, and who is also the co-founder of uh, My Delivery Heroes. And lastly, we have Ms. Dang P. Marian, who is the sustainability manager uh, for H&M. So before we move on, I would like to, it is my absolute pleasure to invite um, our head of school, Professor Pervez Ahmad, to welcome yeah. all of you. Over to you, Professor Pervez. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Priya, for that uh, introduction. Uh, uh, let me uh, begin by welcoming uh, the participants uh, to this uh, public forum, uh, which, as uh, Priya said, uh, says, uh, leaving no one behind. That's a, a big tagline, uh, bringing positive changes to people's lives under the Sustainable Development uh, Goals. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, our four panelists uh, for uh, agreeing to spend their time uh, today to sort of share their insights, their thoughts, their views on the way forward to actually you know, make for a more inclusive uh, society for the future. And I see that uh, all of them are very young compared to me and they, they are the stewards uh, of the future. And I, I believe the future is going to sort of lie with, with all the young people uh, that I, uh, are participating today and also, uh, uh, also the panelists as well. Uh, so I, I think um, when I was given this title, I just sort of looked at it and sort of wondered what I had to sort of say. I even asked uh, Priya, I said, uh, what exactly uh, do I need to uh, uh, reflect over? And just looking at the title, so it really sort of brought me back to uh, the SDGs, uh, where I think uh, this whole initiative really sort of begins. The leaving no one uh, behind tagline really sort of emerged from uh, the SDGs, which were set up in uh, 2015, uh, superseding the Millennium uh, uh, Development uh, Goals. And I, I guess uh, one of the sort of key initiatives, the, the driving force between uh, uh, behind this uh, initiative of leaving no one behind was to address uh, the issue of poverty, to eradicate poverty uh, by uh, 2030. That was uh, uh, the kind of uh, macro goal that was actually uh, set for everybody to achieve. Whether we will achieve that or not is a, a very different uh, thing. And uh, uh, I think current estimates say that we are unlikely to achieve uh, that goal by 2030, uh, we will still have about a half a billion people uh, below the poverty line uh, by that time. Uh, but if we sort of look at it historically, I think it's on sort of paints a very uh, interesting picture. I always sort of think of uh, this as as a kind of a canvas. It's like a, a Kandinsky picture, really. Uh, when you sort of look at the uh, the picture, it looks rather beautiful. Uh, and I, I can sort of say that if we look at the history of uh, uh, progress, economic progress. Uh, even sort of progress in terms of poverty, it looks uh, very positive. I mean, even if we just look at uh, recent history, uh, we find that uh, progress has been made. If we look at the number of people living below the poverty line, uh, which uh, is defined as uh, having less than uh, earnings, uh, less than $1.9 per day. Uh, in 1990, for example, 36% uh, of the world's population, that is roughly 1.9 billion, about 2 billion people, were living under the poverty line. That's extreme poverty, not just sort of a uh, middle kind of uh, poverty. Uh, but if we sort of look at the most recent estimates, uh, what we have sort of progressed to is have about 10% of the world's population uh, is uh, uh, living under uh, the uh, poverty line. Uh, that 10% is equivalent to 730 4 million to be precise, but actually roughly around uh, still a billion people who are actually living below uh, 
the uh, property line. So that looks actually quite good. And if you want to uh, look at it uh, really at the currently, about half the world, actually about 4 billion people uh, have a household income less than $2.5. So when we start looking at those figures, yeah, they, they look worrying, but at the same time, we can sort of see progress has been made over time. If we back, went back all the way to uh, 1900, uh, we would sort of say uh, that a vast proportion of the world's population actually would be uh, lived uh, below the poverty line. So uh, we have uh, made considerable uh, uh, progress. Uh, but this doesn't actually sort of still take away the fact that we have, uh, as I just said, uh, about 4 billion people uh, living uh, with less than $10 per household uh, per day. So uh, what we still have is a large amount of people who are extremely poor. Uh, they're essentially living on the sidelines. They're watching progress. So, so the world and economies have progressed over time. Uh, but prosperity isn't there for all. Uh, so, so what we are sort of seeing is that we have people who have prospered, but also there are people who have been excluded. They are living their lives in scarcity. They're living without food. They're living without access to uh, clean water. They are living without access to good education, uh, access, uh, living without uh, uh, security and shelter. Uh, and, and these populations are actually sort of you know, not only just living there, they're actually caught in uh, these poverty traps uh, where what we're sort of seeing is at the top line, I mean, if you look like the Kandinsky picture uh, analogy, it looks rather beautiful. But if you sort of go to different parts of the canvas, you see other aspects of the story, different stories emerging uh, there. And if we sort of look below the surface of the progress, what we see is wealth inequities the the the, the wealthy are actually sort of not, uh, actually increasing in wealth the middle classes are also sort of rising slowly but the poor are stagnating or declining so what we're actually not seeing and observing is in fact a deepening of the divide uh, so so we are, we we are actually sort of seeing that uh, and i think the most stark picture i can sort of think of was uh, from a study by oxfam in uh, 2018 uh, which someone sort of give a very uh, pictorial rep representation. They said, if you could put the richest people in the world into one bus, that is, and that one bus is capable of only taking about 40 people, 40 of the richest people in the world, they would have more wealth than 66% of the world's population. So you can sort of imagine that, that I could actually fit all those people in my room over here and they would have more than 66% of the world's population's wealth. So this is the level of inequity. And that inequity and the gap is actually increasing over time. So this tells us uh, that there are real severe problems that actually will exist uh, in the way we are driving uh, economic development, the way we're looking at prosperity. So yes, prosperity is there, but it's not there for everybody. Uh, so what we're observing is that the world's poor are the most vulnerable and the most susceptible uh, group. Uh, and that is no shock. I mean, it's often, if we sort of look at what, what, what took place, the susceptibility. In the 2004 uh, tsunami, for example, uh, 230,000 people died uh, in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, uh, and uh, uh, India, and uh, other related countries. If we see a similar tsunami that actually occurred in 2011 in Japan, a developed country, only 19,000 people died. Now, 19,000 people is a lot of people, but compared to 230,000, it's a, a small fraction. And the real difference in the death toll was due to poverty. So, uh, so the bur burden of poverty is, uh, is, is, is creating these uh, exclusions and disadvantage. And it's not just economic or physical, it's also mental and it's, it's psychological. And in fact, poverty is multidimensional. So this is an important thing to someone really bear in mind that uh, uh, we, we should be looking at po poverty, not just in terms of monetary uh, wealth, but uh, poverty in terms of healthcare, uh, education. Uh, and, and, and it's actually something more defined by socioeconomic identities, uh, your socioeconomic uh, status, your gender, your ethnicity, and geography. So these are all things which actually sort of know, uh, define exclusion. So poverty is one factor which defines exclusion, but there are other things which are actually sort of uh, creating uh, exclusion. So, so 
poverty is linked to exclusion, but it's not the only factor which actually uh, uh, creates it. Uh, so uh, we have to sort of look at the multidimensional nature of the disadvantaged and vulnerable communities that actually you know, uh, 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 exist in the world today. And if we were to sort of take that into account, the estimates actually suggest that more than 50%, our sort of current estimates of poverty line, uh, you know, uh, people living below the poverty line, they that would increase by 50%. So rather than being 1 billion, it would be about 1.5 billion people living in extreme poverty uh, under a, a multi-dimensional uh, uh, construct. So uh, I, I think we have to sort of look at that and we have to look at uh, exclusion of uh, uh, people uh, as, as something that is very serious. Uh, which robs people of uh, the opportunities and access to, to, to actually progress their lives uh, and renders them into extremely vulnerable situations. Uh, as we sort of now are facing COVID-19, we see that playing out. The most susceptible individuals are actually those who are actually sort of not, uh, uh, under the poverty line uh, and, and they, are the suffer they are suffering. We also see the most susceptible are, say, for example, the black communities, indigenous communities. These are, are the people that have been actually you know, ex ex excluded, who live in on the fringes of society. So I think it is our moral imperative to ensure that we leave no one behind. So that is where I would like to sort of end. I, I think uh, it was a term that was coined by uh, the SDGs uh, when they were sort of set up. But I think it is a challenge for us as individuals uh, and also in, at the university uh, to actually look at this and, and start asking ourselves some fundamental questions. What do we educate? How do we educate? What is the economic model that we're actually sort of subscribing to? Should it be overall? Should it be overturned? Uh, and what should, it, uh, what should we replace it with? So we have to ask some very fundamental questions of what we do and how we do them. And it is great to actually have uh, four panelists here today to sort of share some of their thoughts, uh, to sort of begin asking some of those questions, uh, and perhaps also finding individual uh, solutions. So I always sort of find that solutions are never made at the top. They're always made at the bottom. Uh, they're always made at the grassroots, where one person makes a small difference. Every individual can make a unique difference and change the world for the better. And if all of us we did, did it, there would be a huge impact. So I look forward to uh, uh, listening to the discussion today, and I also want to thank uh, Priya for actually sort of setting this uh, up and inviting me. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I look forward to listening to uh, uh, to you. Thank you. That's thank me. You, professor. Thank you, Professor Perwes. Um, that is that was in, in that indeed set the tone for the rest of the discussion today. And I could not agree uh, more with you that um, it's due to poverty that most of these other um, uh, vulnerable social groups have come about. And so in the, in, in the interest of asking the questions, having a discussion and being as inclusive as possible, it is my pleasure to, um, to ask the first question and invite um, uh, Ramya uh, from Project Liberate, uh, Juliana Adam uh, from BGPG Initiative, uh, Radhika, uh, uh, Monash Alumni, and Marion from H&M. So the first question I would like to start with is um, an introduction of yourself um, and your organization, the work that you do, and your role in sustainability um, or the SDGs. Perhaps we could start with you, Ramya. Hi there. Um, Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Executive Assistant at Project Liberate. Um, and what that basically means is that I shadow our Executive Director, Nikki um, Shern. And basically, I work closely with her on the projects that we do for our organization. Um, I'm also a recent Monash graduate, so I'm really glad to be here. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, basically I also identify as an intersectional and queer feminist um, and I'm very passionate about human rights, especially the rights of migrant workers and migrant communities in Malaysia. So that's me. Uh, a little bit about Project Liberate is uh, basically we're a nonprofit organization that aims to shift the attitudes and behaviors 
um, around the issue of human trafficking and exploitation, um, primarily through youth mobilization, public education, technology, research, um, as well as the triple A concept, which is attention, attachment, and action. And what that means is we try to attract um, our audiences with uh, knowledge and information, create an attachment to the issue, and through that, try to compel more people to action. So that's a little bit about us as well, yeah. Oh, wow, thank you, Ramya, that's, that's great. I just came to know about Project Liberate um, very recently as well, and I'm really um, uh, loving the work you do because it's, it's, it's very much a part of my research as well. So um, Radhika, hi Radhika, you are, you are appearing on my screen right now and it's uh, welcome to this forum and if you could introduce yeah. yourself and tell us a little bit about um, your role or the work that you do. Thanks Ms. Priya. So hi everyone, I'm Radhika. I graduated from Monash in 2015. I went on to work in consulting for five years and in 2018, 2019, I led the Monash alumni business chapter I went back to studying this year, my MSc in HRM in King's College London. And when I came back uh, on the first day of the MCO, I realized that there were so many people impacted by COVID. There was so much change happening overnight. And so very quickly, me and my dear friend, Karis, who's a co-founder, we worked together many times. We said to think, who are the people impacted? Who are the frontliners and who's being left out? Right? There were lots of people helping out. There were lots of aid going for doctors and nurses and students in the B40, but there are groups of the community that's left out. And that's when we started to come up with the idea for My Delivery Heroes, which is a kindness movement to inspire small but actionable steps for everyday Malaysians to help vulnerable groups in society. So one of the first targets that we approach are delivery riders. So they're like your grab drivers, food panda riders. Many of them belong to the B40 community. Uh, many of them um, also work multiple jobs. You know, you also have single parents, various marginalized groups. And we had a very simple first initiative, which is basically to get Malaysians to sponsor a meal and tag five friends in that challenge. So it was quick, scalable, actionable, required very little cost, and it took off really quickly. And then we've collaborated with two or three other organizations to help to give groceries to B40 communities, donate masks. Currently, we're doing a mass donation campaign. We've partnered with a local um, Nyonya Kain, their local boutique. Um, we donated masks, about 400 masks we have raised so far to taxi drivers, cleaners, security guards, riders, basically anyone in the community who is vulnerable during this COVID situation and who needs protection. So that's just a little bit about what we do. Okay, great, Radhika. We'll, we'll come back to you soon enough. And I, I stumbled across my delivery heroes, you know, where else but on Instagram. And I was so impressed that, you know, our Monash alumni had started this kindness movement. Okay, so um, I have Juliana Adam here, who is the CEO of BGBD Initiative. Um, no stranger to social enterprise and uh, exemplary work that you're doing. So Juliana, can we, can we know a little bit about you and your role? Thanks, Priya. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Juliana. I'm currently leading BGBG Initiative. So BGBG, we are a social enterprise. Um, we've been established since 2012, and our main focus of operation is on environmental sustainability. Uh, and how we do this is basically through upcycling, and uh, we do have a social impact um, uh, arm to it as well, where basically whatever that we do on the environmental side, we try to put in uh, like poverty alleviation or improving the livelihoods of the beneficiaries who are involved. So under BGBG, there's also um, our sister company, which is Moreka Makerspace. That one focuses more on the um, makerspace and also education programs, uh, providing, uh, you know, upskilling programs um, to youth and also young adults. And we also have the BGBG ethical fashion, which is more obviously on the fashion side, uh, where we upcycle seat belts and also any corporate waste materials into fashion accessories. Uh, mainly it's um, bags lah, and we sell this uh, for the B2B. So it's more on a bulk order, but we do have a section on the B2C side as well. 
Um, so that's about the company. Uh, we are venturing into a more tech platform and that's our uh, having to pivot um, after the COVID, after MCO. And I'm sure like you guys are aware of that as well. Like there's a lot of uh, things that needs to be changed in the way that we do business and in the delivery or rather in the service that we deliver. So that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, so yeah, so that's PTPT. Okay, thank you, Juliana. Um, uh, so I, I also have Marion here, who is from um, h and and she's the sustainability manager. And um, can we have a few words from you, Marion, uh, Marion, and the role that you have in h and m Yes, hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, Hello, my name is uh, Marian, uh, Sustainability Manager for H&M um, Southeast Asia. Um, so when it comes to fashion, um, well, first of all, I think you may know H&M, uh, uh, which is now one of uh, a big uh, fashion retailers. Uh, but when it comes to fashion, uh, we also know that there's quite an impact on our planet, uh, not only on the environment, but also on the society in general. So that's why sustainability is a very important focus for H&M Group. Um, and we think that we need fashion in the way how we work in order to make it sustainable uh, in the long run. Um, Things to tell about this, I think we will go into more details later. But uh, basically, um, my role is then how can we make, uh, or actually, how can we implement the sustainability work here in the region? Uh, talking about Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, and uh, the Philippines um, to make uh, fashion overall more sustainable and uh, on, the, on, the, on the planet. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we've got a diverse um, uh, uh, group of panelists here. Um, human trafficking, a kindness movement, um, Marika, which does a lot of work in different areas, and uh, fashion in, in H&M. So I would just like to dive into this right now and ask, and ask you all the, you know, the first question in reference to leaving no one behind and bringing about social change. So can you identify important initiatives that your organizations um, or you have done through your work um, to deliver specifically, you know, social change? Because we know that there are three main areas that it is it's environmental, economic and social change. Um, so uh, in line with the team today, uh, you know, um, could you tell us about your initiatives and how has it impacted the community? Basically, um, your stories. Uh, can we start with uh, Juliana? Okay. Um, for us, basically, we focus on the environmental, as I mentioned just now, and through that also, we have an impact on the social side. Um, the project that I am closely working on is actually called Beyond Bins, which is more focused on plastic recycling at a uh, micro scale with the B40 communities or the other sub communities. So um, basically, beyond beans, we provide these uh, micro-scale, small-scale machines, uh, recycling machines to the communities. We teach them how, about sustainability. We teach them about how to recycle using the machine. And we also we teach them how to produce new uh, recycled products from the machine itself. So through that, um, when, they when they produce these recycled products, right, they actually get to sell it um, either as part of ecotourism or uh, when BGBG goes out to get like corporate orders from um, our clients, we would use our, these communities as the suppliers. So that's how we, we incorporate like the social uh, aspect of it. So we teach them about how to improve their own uh, environmental livelihoods, um, to not like burn plastic, to not throw it into the river and things like that. Uh, and instead teaching them that um, there is value to this waste and uh, they can create new things out of it. And that's where we, they actually um, get to get alternative uh, source of income for themselves through this production of the materials. Uh, so that's one way that BGBG is, is um, making change. We currently have about three communities that we work with for this. Mainly, are, uh, two of them are actually orang Asik communities. And uh, one of it is, in, is based in an island. So this island, they don't have, I mean, obviously in islands, right, they don't have access to um, recycling facilities. And if they were to bring back the, the waste materials to mainland, it's going to be super expensive. Um, so what we provide is like uh, the shredder machine, which allows them to bring back more materials to mainland to be recycled. So it reduces their cost to, for recycling anyway. 
Um, so far, we have worked with uh, big corporations in providing uh, orders to for these recycled uh, materials. Um, these are like you know just draw gifts uh, for their uh, giveaways for the events and things like that. But obviously, this has been affected um, during the PPE. Uh, sorry, during the MCO and the COVID. Uh, so, still working with the B40s, we have actually um, gotten them to produce PPEs for the frontliners um, and that's one way that we had to shift uh, ourselves as well to, to still keep ourselves afloat but also to still be able to help the community. Can you give us a success story, something that you have personally encountered um, that um, you know, uh, has improved the lives of, of people in, within this community that, where you have um, undertaken this fantastic initiative? The, well, the, the, the one that really uh, jumps to mind, maybe because it's like recent, is the PPE story. Um, so when the MCO started, uh, we were scrambling because we lost a lot of projects. Uh, and you know, losing projects means losing revenue and we couldn't support the communities that we work with. Uh, so um, then we had a chat with one of the doctors who at that point, like, uh, you know, there was this need for PPEs, right? There was this uh, lack of, of supplies. So they asked us, um, how can we help? And we thought like, you know, uh, and, and at that point it was face shields. So us being makers and uh, us having this network of makers as well, we just um, got all these 3D printers, uh, people with access to machineries um, to come on board and help produce these uh, face shields for the frontliners. And that led on to like the phase two of our PPE efforts, where we found out like um, the hospitals and the clinics are also um, in need of the isolation gowns. So we went on to uh, produce the isolation gowns, but on our side, uh, instead of making it ourselves, we got our communities involved. Um, these are communities that we have been working with and also we work with like other SEs that have tailors on board and these tailors are like the from you know the PPRs from the B40 communities um, who have also lost their jobs because of the MCO. So uh, it, it was very heartwarming because when we put out the call to look for our tailors um, it was overwhelming response uh, and actually one of like the Okay, the, the PPEs were actually sold to, I mean, the corporates were ordered the PPEs for the frontliners. And so like the, um, the producers, the tailors actually do get the income from these PPEs as well. So one of the uh, success stories actually, um, the sales from these PPEs are actually, uh, I, I would say um, about one quarter of what we normally would get uh, on, an, on a normal financial year for BGBG. Uh, so we did get to to improve or either uh, provide additional income for these people who have lost their jobs. I think it was about total of two hundred or three hundred thousand um, in about a month's time. Wow! Yeah. So so that that was one of like the the heartwarming uh, stories that we have. Oh, thank you, Juliana. It's good to know, <laughs> especially now when people are losing their jobs. Um, you know, everywhere. Um, okay, uh, Ramia, um, I'm, I'm interested to, to know about the initiatives of your organization and, you know, tell us um, your story. Okay, uh, so with the work that Project Liberate does, a lot, there's a lot of focus on uh, public education, social media and technology. So one of the initiatives that we're most proud of is when um, in conjunction with World Day Against Trafficking in Prison, we launched um, the first national anti-trafficking chatbot, uh, which is available on our Facebook page. And basically, um, what went into this was because when we were looking into current issues faced in terms of reporting potential trafficking cases or situations of exploitation, um, a lot of the time, many people, like especially vulnerable communities like migrant workers, would uh, struggle in terms of language barrier because the current uh, hotline system, there's only two available languages, which is English and Malay. Um, and another thing 
is that they're not available 24 seven. So um, that's also what we wanted to look into. Um, and so based on that, um, we came up with the chatbot, which is a platform that is easy, um, safe and secure um, for all communities of people, especially vulnerable communities to report a case from anywhere and at any point in time, um, as well as providing a like standardized platform for reporting because um, the other issue would be that with most organizations, there's always a different standard or different set of procedures for reporting a potential trafficking case, which is, it can be very confusing for a lot of people. So that was a gap that we wanted to fill with this new technology as well. Um, yeah. So, so was there is there any reporting that has come through? Um, uh, how successful has that platform been in in a sense? A number of uh, like people using the chatbot. Um, another we also the chatbot is also there to for people to learn and engage with it because it also provides information on human trafficking, uh, forced labor. Uh, there's also a very gender specific element to it where if you want to learn about uh, domestic violence and violence against women migrant workers, people can go and do that. And um, women migrant workers can also use uh, the chatbot to report a potential domestic violence case because they also go through uh, the domestic violence as well. Yeah, so that's one initiative. Um, another one that we're currently in the midst of is our advocate on the road campaign, uh, which is when we travel to different high schools and universities across the country and conduct workshops to help young people um, basically learn more about the issue of human trafficking. To enter the conversation about human trafficking and migrant workers' rights and also provide them with the knowledge and skill set to take the information and go back to their communities and empower them as well. Um, and we have gone to a couple of schools so far and um, we monitor their progress afterwards. Um, but obviously due to COVID-19, we have not been able to carry that out. But once, you know, uh, things get better, we will get right back to it. Yeah. Do you think it's been impactful, these um, workshops that you do at universities and schools? Yes, definitely, because uh, one thing that we've noticed um, when we go to these different schools and universities is that the more information that young people receive, uh, the more they want to know more and do more as well. Because um, I think a lot of our education systems lack, um, in, like in terms of talking about these issues, and it's not even surprising that most people assume that it doesn't even happen in Malaysia at all. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the gap that we are trying to fill with our initiatives. And we have seen a lot of good work and a lot of um, change in people and students, especially after, you know, uh, disseminating information. And stuff. Yeah, so one of the key issues is changing the mindset of future business leaders, right? And um, I think uh, raising awareness with them is, is really a, a, a very important move in terms of education as well. Yeah. Marion um, from H&M, uh, uh, you know, uh, tell us some of the important initiatives you have done around circular fashion um, and bringing about social change. Yeah, so um, actually this is a very, again, a very important topic. Um, so at H&M Group, we are uh, the signatories of the United Nations uh, Global Compact. So we are very committed to adopt uh, sustainable and responsible policies and uh, to report on our implementation. So actually we have set a very clear uh, vision uh, at the global level. The vision is to lead the change towards circular um, and climate positive fashion or being a fair and equal company. So with this um, 
vision, we are actually able to influence the, uh, the SDGs either directly, uh, indirectly or through our partnerships. Um, so then we talk about all the, the goals when it comes to gender equality, when it comes to uh, reducing inequality in general, about econo economic growth, about uh, water, um, sanitation, about climate action, uh, responsible consumption, and so on and so on. Um, so there's a lot of things to say, but maybe to narrow it a bit down because when we talk about the impact on the society we talk about um, of course the internal employees that we have but also everyone in the whole value chain um, yeah. when it comes to the workers the garment workers uh, but also just the general uh, the society in general some of the things is that um, at H&M we um, think it's important to create uh, decent and meaningful jobs for, for the people, fair jobs, uh, and also that we need to promote inclusiveness and diversity. Um, so some examples when it comes to the supply chain is that um, we don't own any factories ourselves, so we work with suppliers who are employing the workers. So we need to make sure that those suppliers are actually having good uh, wage management systems in place. So we have implemented um, di uh, worker dialogues programs where the workers can have a dialogue with their representatives uh, to talk about the working conditions, to talk about the wages, uh, wage management systems to have a more transparent on how the wage and the salaries are being um, calculated so that they know as well what they need to do to improve the wages or um, to uh, improve their skills. Uh, we're also working together with a lot of partners in order to drive to drive change when it comes to human rights and uh, labor conditions, for instance, with um, industrial or the International Labor Organization, um, or that we are part of ACT, um, Action um, Collaboration Transformation, to drive the change throughout all the suppliers um, in, in general. Um, that are some examples, um, but there, there are much more. Um, I don't know how much time okay, we have. Yeah, but, no. uh, so, so let me ask you this, like, you know, um, I think the biggest problem, um, you know, maybe in the fashion, like, or, or in companies have doing due diligence over their supply chains. And I think that yeah. was um, the lack of it resulted in the Rana Plaza tragedy, for example. And big mm. brands uh, were, were identified as, you know, um, lacking in uh, doing their due diligence with supply chains and um, being hands off. So um, mm. did that tragedy uh, sort of change the way H&M does business? Is that a turning point or have you always been um, conscionable in, in um, looking into supply chains? Did it have an yeah. impact? Good question. Um, so first of all, uh, the Rana Plaza, it was not the supplier of H&M Group. Yes, um, so I know that, we yeah. Yes. So, but what did happen is that um, at H&M Group, we have been working on sustainability for over 20 years. That is something wow. that a lot of people don't know. Um, but it means that we need to actually refine our strategy continuously and improve it continuously. And we need to speed up when it comes to sustainable fashion. And one way is the transparency part, which is a very important topic that you mentioned, because in order to become sustainable, first you need to know what is happening out there so that you know what challenges to tackle. So we are um, working so much on transparency on uh, which suppliers are we working with, uh, who is making our clothes, how is it being made and um, in what conditions and so on and so on. So H&M has been the first brand actually to um, announce um, publicly our whole list of suppliers online. So you can check um, on which suppliers we are working with, uh, which countries and uh, who the workers are, for instance. Um, we've also been this year been um, uh, awarded as the most, uh, uh, sorry, most transparent um, fashion brand out of 250 retailers by being transparent in our uh, policies and our um, uh, practices when it comes to uh, indeed working conditions and when it comes to climate action, when it comes to uh, consumption, uh, materials and so on. So um, transparency is definitely something that is actually a, a starting point. You need to be transparent in order to drive change altogether. Um, so I, I would not say that only after Rana Plaza that we've started doing it, but we do see more and more that we need to speed up. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. So Ravika, you know, uh, tell us a little bit more about um, My Delivery Heroes and um, how has this really impacted um, the, co the communities that uh, you have um, um, undertaken this initiative with? 
So one of the main objectives of My Delivery Heroes is to show that everyone can make a difference. So I think a common question that we get asked is if I'm just a student or I'm working full time, you know, or if I have a full time corporate job or, you know, I'm not so prominent or I don't have a lot of influence, how can I make a difference? And I think what we wanted to do is to create a platform to come up with easy, actionable steps for people to then very quickly be part of the change, right? So what we did is we identified um, a target group a vulnerable group that needed help, we came up with a very easy solution and we got that to be a challenge. So the very first initiative we did uh, was a tagging challenge. So I don't know if you're aware, during MCO, when it first started, you know, on Instagram, there was all this drawing a carrot or drawing an orange and tagging all your friends, right? So what we did was uh, we built onto that and we said, why don't you buy a delivery rider a meal and you tag five friends to do the same? Um, and it caught on very quickly because one, people like to see the impact of their change immediately. Two is they liaised with the recipient directly. So I think that sense of gratification was there. And three is the cost is very, very minimal. It's like, you know, most people who had their jobs could afford to do that. So I think that opened up the eyes of a lot of people to say that, you know, I didn't realize that these people are out there in the hot sun delivering food, delivering groceries, keeping us safe while we're at home. That sense of empathy was built. And I think that's a connection we're trying to build. So when we talk to a lot of people, a lot of alumni, a lot of students, corporates, um, they don't know where to start and they don't know how can they affect change if that's not part of their nine to five, if that's not part of what they're doing at the moment. And I think that's, I think that's really what Karis and I try to drive, which is everyone can be a part of this. Um, this so what's some of the success stories that really warmed our heart? One of it was, um, so when the challenge was posted online, we had a student who said that her dad was the recipient um, of, of someone buying him a meal. So he's a grab driver. He works really long hours. That particular day, he didn't even have, have time for lunch. So a lot of these workers in the gig economy, their working conditions are very different from what some of us are used to. And I think we need to appreciate that. Some of them don't even have time to have a meal or a break or, you know, and sometimes to meet their targets, their hours and the working conditions can be quite strenuous. So that was really nice because she shared the experience um, and it was just pure surprise, right? That, you know, her dad was, she said, thank you so much. I don't I don't know who started this. Um, I don't know why you decided to buy my dad a meal, but thank you for doing it. It really made his day. And it, I think it reaffirms that, you know, kindness is there. People actually care. Um, the community, the sense of community is there. That's one success story. The second one is there's a student, a Malaysian student in the US who reached out to us and said, I really like this idea and I'm going to do it in the US, in the area that I live in. So I think that was very powerful because to us, that's, that's exactly what we want. We want people to take this concept that, yes, I can, um, I can make change. You know, I can be the change that I wish to see and then do that in whichever small way that, you know, that they can do. Um, the second initiative that we did was we partnered with Little Helpers Scale to deliver groceries to the B40 families. Um, and through that, we really got to see how, you know, these families, they're going through so much struggles during this period. A lot of them are actually day-to-day -day job earners, they're nasi lemak sellers, you know, they're taxi drivers. Um, and what we did was we actually raised funding through people. So by us connecting directly to the community, I think people were able to see that these people really need change. There was a lot of donor fatigue, right? There was a lot of, oh, you know, there's so much work being done. So why do I need to donate? Um, there were things like, you know, all these big corporations are doing it and why do we still need to help? And I think the objective of our organization is to show that we have real people and real stories to tell you, you know, and these people need your help. And we've got pictures and we've got, and we're actually calling them, we call them one by one to make sure that our recipient list for people who deserve the help because these were donations that were going to them. Um, and I think that is something really impactful when we come back full circle and people are like, you know, I want to do something too. So if you have a new project, if you have a new idea, let me know. So in the long run, we're looking towards coming up uh, with a model where we educate and inspire change um, through students and through people who are in the corporate world. And we want everyone, so leaving no one behind, it's not just the recipients, but also people who affect change, right? I think everyone needs to be a part of this. It's not just the NGOs, it's not just the corporations, but it's each and every one of us. Yes, um, um, definitely, Radhika, and, and, and which brings me to my next question, and because your initiative uh, took off during the COVID-19, and uh, you looked at it as an opportunity to start something, just as Juliana did with BGBG Initiative and, you know, Project uh, Liberate as well, and um, so I want to ask you this question, in what ways has COVID-19 affected your work? Has it 
um, given you more ideas or, uh, of innovation of how to use technology? Has it um, been more of a challenge or have you um, adapted to this situation and come about with um, um, richer than before and affected your community in, um, in, in more impactful ways? Juliana. Um, it was definitely a crisis when we started the MCO. Um, like I mentioned just now, like we were scrambling, we were panicking because like jobs got cancelled and we were losing clients and things like that. Um, but it actually uh, got us to firstly start the PPE project. Uh, so that was great. It uh, kept us busy. Um, but it also got our company to be uh, working on a more technical or digital side of things so uh because we had to work from home there's a lot of platforms that we had to to really make use of and these are platforms that we already subscribe to but we just never really like use it to its full potential um so i have a question uh, uh, hmm. i mean uh during this time i mean we are all like in isolation how did you build partnerships how did you um get beyond that problem of that physical presence Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of it's a lot of this it's a lot of Zoom calls, Zoom meetings, and things like that, right? Um, uh, we we had to keep the relationship within our team because we have quite a fairly large uh, team uh, base. Uh, we've got fifty people in, in the team in total, so we had to keep the spirits up. We had to keep getting people, uh, you know, motivated to do their work with uh, all the bad news that's happening and all that. So um, we actually started incorporating uh, training sessions. Um, share, uh, so we do that on a weekly basis now. Um, we have sharing sessions. We've also started uh, like a, a buddy system. So um, we have like, you know, certain uh, HR advisories who are like your peer buddies that you can go and talk to, bounce off ideas. Um, if you have anything that's bothering you in your personal life, uh, you can always talk to someone. So that's what we wanted to provide to the people, like, you know, just sort of like a emotional and mental support rather than just keeping it very, like, you know, work-based and things like that. Um, so that's, that's how we, that's what we felt that we needed to do because, uh, you know, when, when you're in the office, you're always like, you can go for lunch together, you can just chit-chat about things and then you forget about, like, you know, whatever troubles that you have. But if you're at home, um, you're kind of missing that element, that social part of it. So we wanted to still keep that alive. And uh, to be honest, that's the, that's the main thing, or rather that's the main point where um, people would focus on when they, when they work with BGBG, especially the interns, right? They say like um, the best thing about BGBG is the people that they work with. And we just, uh, we, we recognize that and we wanted to keep that alive. So in terms of um, what COVID or what the MCO has done to us is uh, they, it actually, uh, made us rethink our uh, business model. Um, we had to unfortunately shut down certain uh, pipelines, um, but that was great because uh, we were, I guess, in denial before MCO anyway. And uh, this whole situation just um, made us open our eyes and had to make these sort of uh, harsh decisions, which then leads to um, better outcomes. Uh, we have always had like a plan um, for the near future to go digital, like to have a, an online platform, um, you know, connecting people, connecting talents to, to uh, uh, job seekers, sorry, connecting job seekers to high risk. Um, and we wanted to do that in like, you know, the next one, two years. But because of the current situation and seeing the need to go digital and to help out the gig workers and things like that, um, we had to speed up our, pl our plans. And uh, something that was supposed to be launched in two years is aimed to be launched end of this year. Uh, so that was great. I mean, it, it, it got us to, to you know, just start acting and not just wait for the right time. Because this is the right time we, we found out. Um, so yeah, it, it's a very exciting time for us because we are um, shifting a lot of our traditional things that we used to do. Um, I mentioned just now, uh, BGBG is very much focused on environmental sustainability. Um, and that's one thing that we always shout about. We don't really, uh, we don't really focus on like, uh, you know, the income generation, the improvement, improving the livelihoods of our communities. But 
seeing the the situation now, we see the need to rebuild people's lives, and that's what we want to focus on. And uh, this is where like there's a lot of more uh, focus on the upskilling programs that we're running uh, with Mareka. Um, you know, all this kind of uh, getting people to to sort of have. Um, even if you're a gig worker, have a financial security or financial um, insurance, um, you know, all those kind of things in place. So that's what we're doing now. Um, it was a crisis, the MCO and the COVID, but uh, I see it as a good thing, actually. Okay, so building on that, I would, I would ask, you know, since we have a lot of students here today, right? I would like to ask this question. Um, maybe Marion can, can start off the discussion. So, um, you know, a lot has been done during this COVID-19 and, you know, uh, Juliana, from what you have spoken, I see the need to, of, of uh, students and maybe fresh graduates to have the ability to be adaptive, to be, um, um, to have that skill to want to relearn and to be flexible. So, um, what do you think are the skills needed for the fresh, for fresh graduates coming out into the world um, in terms of even sustainability in today's world? Marian, can we, can we have your opinion? Yes, um, good question also, because I think um, when it comes to sustainability, uh, everyone has a part in this. And then we don't only talk about uh, business leaders, about um, uh, corporations, academics, but also individuals like you, me, and all the students in here. Um, and I think COVID-19 has actually shown us that the community, the people, and the planet, the environment is so interlinked, it's so intertwined. So all our actions are actually directly influencing the environment that we live in. Um, and then we, we talk about what actions can we then actually take uh, on, a, on a small scale. Um, for instance, if you like fashion, I think all of you are having clothes on now, uh, I, although I cannot see uh, the majority of the people. But um, when we are consuming or when we buy fashion, can you think a bit more of, um, is it really needed, for instance, the, the, the garments that you buy? And if you buy it, will you wear it and will you not throw it away? So those are already some small mindsets, some small shifts in, in your uh, way of thinking that can contribute towards uh, sustainable fashion. But also when you have the garments at home, um, the way you wash it, can you wash it a little bit on lower temperature instead of uh, 40 degrees, 30 degrees, or even cold? In that way, you can already save some energy. Um, and then again, if you are tired of a certain garment, but it's still um, very um, uh, wearable, can you maybe upcycle it? Or can you repair it? Or can you bring it for recycling? Um, there are quite some small things that everyone can do. Um, or another example, for instance, in Malaysia, we started to charge for the paper bags in the stores. That's because we want to reduce the amount of waste. So if you go shopping, can you bring your own uh, shopping bag instead of uh, getting a plastic or paper bag every time you go uh, to the supermarket or to a fashion retailer? So those are examples um, for everyone to think about. Mm -hmm. So basically, they should have, um, you know, um, hopefully fresh graduates should have that um, empathy chip that um, Radhika was talking about earlier, the, the, that, that conscience and the conscionability in, um, in, in, in the things we consume, in responsible consumption. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think just one addition is that uh, being informed, that's very important. Being informed what you are wearing, why you are consuming and, and how, um, and then what you're wearing, also the materials that you are wearing at the moment. Uh, where does it come from? What is the composition of a dress or a certain trousers? Um, so getting yourself informed and uh, make more conscious decisions that way. Okay, great. Okay, Rami and Radhika, I would like to ask you this question, since this is, um, you know, um, it's Monash is an education institution, and you do work on human trafficking, Ramya, and, and you know, yours is a kindness movement, uh, Radhika. How do you think is, um, uh, how important do you think is partnerships and collaborations um, uh, in uh, bringing more um, awareness and education about the issues um, to students? in the next decade of action, let's say. Ramya, what, what, how do you think, how, how important and do you have any ideas about how we could move forward with collaborations for the future generations to be more aware? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, our organization really values the importance of partnership, especially 
achieve all the SDG or global goals. Um, so we don't just see it as necessary, but vital. Um, we have, especially with the issue that we're facing, it's not an individual issue, it's a collective issue. Um, so recently, our organization has worked with, um, along with Global Shepherds and other relevant stakeholders, we um, have recently been working with the government to work on and produce a national guidelines on human trafficking indicators. Um, and what that means is because there are a lot of um, indicators that um, to highlight whether or not a case could be um, a potential case of trafficking. So what the problem is often is that it's not always a textbook trafficking is to create a standard um, guideline, especially for enforcement agencies. So to, for them to better identify cases of trafficking and work to also potentially increase the prosecution rate in Malaysia because at the moment our rate of prosecution for traffickers is quite low. And so we seek to improve that and we think partnership with the government and working towards these guidelines and um, giving these guidelines to enforcement agencies would really help in that sense. Um, we've also been working with the government on a national action plan, which is essentially a five-year plan on how to eradicate human trafficking and exploitation in Malaysia. Uh, so that's also what we've been working on. And we are also in a coalition with other NGOs in Malaysia that share the same goals that we do. Um, and we discuss, especially it's important to keep in touch with people who work towards ending all forms of um, modern slavery in Malaysia. So what role can students play in um, the work, for example, the work that you do? I know that you do a lot of uh, partnership work with other educational institutions. So what, what role do, can students play? I think students can play a big role in terms of just starting to be vocal. We, as our, because our organization is young, of young people and also we work with young people we also recognize the power and potential that young people have in making and creating social change um, and we've seen that with um, a lot of the people who've worked with us and they become brand ambassadors and they and they eventually come and work for us you know so um, they can sorry uh, a lot of it starts with um, being vocal and also trying to learn more and engage more and we can engage with them um, and etc basically okay thank you Ramia so Radhika if you had one advice for the students here today um, you know based on the kindness movement that you started during the MCO what would that be? I would say do something. If you see an area that needs help, if you know people who need help, if you see an area where you need to be more vocal or action needs to be taken, do something. I think as, as, you know, as a student and not too long ago as well, sometimes when the issue looks too big, you're too afraid to try. Right, because you have this inertia, and I think there's a term for it, I can't remember where the issue is too big, and then it's just too big for anyone to solve. But I think what students need to realize is unless so many people come together and work together, it's an ecosystem of the universities, the corporations, the students, um, and all these, the government, all these bodies come together. So I think students need to realize their power and their potential in being change makers. I think the universities need to equip them with the tools to enforce change. Great. Juliana, what do you think? What advice would you have to this, for the students here today to, if, to have more impact on social change? Um, I guess three main things. Um, firstly, is just not to be afraid to start. So the, the key word is just, just start, uh, whatever that you feel very strongly about. Um, and also to find uh, comrades 
so people to fight with you towards this change uh, that's important because um, you know like like you mentioned just now we spoke about uh, collaboration right you cannot achieve something alone you need to work um, with others and leverage off each other's expertise to achieve something um, and the last one I would say is actually to uh, be informed so just know what's happening out there know who is doing what uh, just have your I guess bullets or your points ready um, know about know fully about the, the item or like the, the topic that you're gonna be uh, wanting to fight for and just just be informed in that sense so I think these three things apart from like you know uh, having empathy and, and all this sort of stuff uh, I think these three things are super important to have Thank you. Marion, what do you think? What, what advice would you give to the students here today? Um, my advice is actually um, start informing yourself and um, create awareness um, in everything that you do. Be more aware and see uh, what actions you can take, what small actions you can take, because uh, it all helps. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, contribution to this forum. Um, and I would like to invite questions if anybody has um, questions. So looking at um, some of the um, Slido questions that we have today. Um, yeah, so we have, we have um, a question right at the top here. The, you know, this, this could be, you know, um, anybody just jump in, right? Um, so the UN states uh, statistics say that there are still a lot of goals that has shown little to no progress in, by 2019. Do you think the SDGs could be achieved by 2030 or is it too ambitious? What do you all think? Um, okay, Marion, what do you think? Uh, I think it, it is indeed uh, an ambitious goal, but that's why the importance of partnership, um, because it's not, again, uh, one company, one individual or one single unit can drive this change. Therefore, if we all uh, co collaborate and we all work together, um, it should be possible, but there's, uh, of course, uh, work to do. Um, but uh, it would be possible if we uh, continuously work together. That's my um, take on this. Yes, yeah. that's true. I don't think it can be achieved overnight. And it seems like we, we, are, we are facing more and more issues as time goes by. So um, I think it's important to do what we can at the moment as well. Uh, Marion, um, in terms of, you know, um, just looking at the second question, um, do you think companies in general face a problem with government workers, um, uh, you know, um, uh, in times of COVID-19 for, you know, under the decent work um, SDG, do you think it has, it has impacted them and do you think, um, you, uh, you know, companies should, could do more? And I, any... Mm. Mm. Of course, um, first of all, um, uh, everyone has been impacted by COVID-19, but uh, even more the, the, the workers, uh, the suppliers. So this is uh, for sure, um, the impact is huge. Um, there are brands, including H&M actually, we were also the first to announce that we will pay for the orders that we have been canceled. Uh, the orders that have been produced already are under, produ uh, under production um, because we are still uh, responsible, we still want to be responsible for our uh, purchasing uh, actions in this, uh, in this sense. Uh, but we need to do more, so that's why we're also um, signing together with other brands the Global Call to Action in order to come up with solutions, how can we support these workers uh, during the these times, but also more about the long-term plan, uh, how to recover, how uh, can these workers recover after COVID-19. Um, we also have the H&M Foundation, um, aside from the donations that they have been made, um, they have also a program for the female workers in uh, Bangladesh and how to upskill them, how to reskill them, uh, train them to make them more resilient um, during this period of time, but also after COVID um, to remain relevant in the workforce. So um, this is a group that is super vulnerable and we see that there's a big impact um, and that we need to support uh, the workers uh, as much as we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Um, I have a, another question here. Maybe uh, somebody could, uh, you know, um, Ramia, maybe you could, you could take this one. 
um, or Radhika, do you think the available education system meets the changing world? And how easily are the less privileged, you know, um, uh -huh. but let's take the first question. Do you think the available education system meets the changing world? What do you think? You guys are, uh, you know, uh, ex Monash students. So what do you think? Radhika. Okay, let's start with Radhika. Uh, um, so I have to say, I think my first introduction into humanitarian work was in your class. So ethics and corporate governance. So I think, <laughs> I think there are parts of the education system that is beginning to change and it's beginning to become a lot more relevant and a lot making people a lot more aware. So I remember as a student, I had no idea, you know, how chocolate is produced or garments are being produced, who's behind this, what are sweatshops, you know, totally no clue, right? Just a regular consumer buying whatever that's cheap and affordable. Um, and I think that was a good starting point. However, I do feel that because things are changing so quickly, the education system needs to evolve just as quickly. I think besides awareness, there needs to be action. So beyond just making the students aware, how do we give them the tools to become change makers? How do we give them the tools to action the things that they learn in class? Um, and I think that's perhaps something the education system needs to consider. Thank you. Fantastic. What about you, Ramia? What do you think? So I definitely resonate with what Radhika is saying because my um, introduction to humanitarian work also started through Monash because I'm a gender studies major um, and I recognize that also is from a privileged standpoint because not a lot of people can afford to go to Monash and not a lot of people can afford to access the same um, information like the same education and the same type of learning you get at Monash. And so I feel like the education system in Malaysia should have, um, should be able to um, create that kind of awareness through changing um, the ways that we learn about um, our current society as well and introduce more topics um, that may be a little bit, um, I don't wanna say taboo, but um, we definitely don't learn about human trafficking and um, actually it's only for ex for certain in certain institutions as well so I think definitely in terms of education there could be improvement yeah okay thank you thank you guys um, uh, it's, it's it's been a very uh, uh, rich conversation if you if you ask me and um, I've taken um, you know the important questions that I think has um, you have addressed you Marion um, uh, Juliana and uh, uh, Radhika you have, you you have addressed um, just one one more question to um, Juliana um, how aware do you think uh, Malaysians are in terms of SDGs because I know SDGs like a big framework with um, BGBG initiative so I have one question here that looks at um, how aware do you think the Malaysians are about the SDGs? So I think um, generally people know about the SDG, um, but what I notice is that they tend to just throw the term around, um, like, you know, just sort of abuse it basically, like uh, they just take one, one goal and they say, oh, my company is like, you know, um, adopting this and, and this is how we do it but they don't really look at like the indicators behind it, um, what actual uh, impacts are they achieving and things like that. So uh, I think there, there needs to be a lot more um, education or awareness about the, the real uh, effects or real impacts of SDG and how to implement it and things like that and not just take it for granted and, and use it as like a marketing scheme, um, which we have noticed a lot of people are doing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's, it's been a really meaningful conversation, I feel. And it's been, we've, we've looked at different areas uh, because you come from very separate um, areas of the industry. We have a social enterprise, we have a corporation, we have um, a student alumni, and we have an NGO. So um, I would think you, you guys are the pillars of the communities driving sustainable development change. So in, and in line of this whole SDG team, team uh, for World Humanitarian Day, I would, we would just like to showcase something like we, we, we did uh, orientation week. 
Um, Priya? Yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, Priya, can I have one uh, small comment or one? Yeah. Um, yes. Because I see that there are quite some questions about, um, you know, when it comes to the, the workers. Uh, okay. So I think maybe it's good to, to mention a little bit about this. Yeah. Um, first of all, of course, there are. Um, challenges when it comes to the, the suppliers or the workers in Asia and um, over 80% of the production happens in Asia and there's still um, when it comes to human rights, labor conditions, are a lot of work to do but um, what is super important to uh, H&M is that we want to make sure that the workers are having a fair and equal uh, job and that it's uh, happening in a safe environment. But this also means that we need to work together with the governments, with the authorities, with the suppliers and everyone all together to drive this change um, throughout the whole supply chain. Um, but um, when it comes to, for instance, the abuse or the, I think there's a lot of misperceptions uh, or misunderstandings um, about this because this is one thing that we would not tolerate. That's why we have a very strong due diligence uh, system in place. We are very transparent on where the suppliers are, who are the workers. Uh, we even have on our website um, information about how much the workers are being paid and how that is compared to the minimum wage in uh, those countries, for instance. So um, if you want to read more about it uh, you can check also on our sustainability report or on the website um, but this is one thing that uh, I want to highlight that it's very important for the company in general that we need to secure that everything happens in a fair and equal way uh, and uh, this includes human rights and labor conditions um, and that we are um, working hard with everyone to, to make this change and we would not tolerate any um, unethical practices. Thank yeah. you, Marion, because I also think that it needs partnerships with the different stakeholders within the community, right? So, um, yeah. when because it's, it's also, it's just one more comment, because it's also um, the, com uh, the country, the government is setting a minimum wage, which is out of the control of any uh, other independent brand. So if you don't own a factory, it means that uh, we are working with a supplier that is producing for 100 other brands or even more. So if you want to drive change, it needs to come also from the uh, country level, the governmental level, but already then we can make an influence by making these suppliers implementing fair wage management systems, having the work dialogues and uh, the pay that we are having with the workers is already higher than the, the minimum wage um, but that more is needed of course but, yeah thank you thank you Marion thank you for for taking those comments <laughs> um, so thank you panelists and uh, like I just said during the um, orientation week uh, we conducted the SDG video is Instagram challenge um, and we called on our students to um, share uh, whether you know they have made a lifestyle change or taken action to solve a community issue under the SDGs, we wanted to celebrate their contribution to a global cross uh, cause. So we have two videos here that uh, we would like to play for you and um, and announce that the, these uh, these these two uh, students have been the winners of our, our SDG video Instagram challenge. You can find them on the Monash uh, Malaysia Prime Instagram uh, site as well. And um, so Chia is, is playing the first video for you right now. I remind Hizwanyu from School of Business to support the achievement of sustainable development goals. I choose goal 12 and here's how you can contribute to. By doing this, we can actually save three to four gallons of water per person per day. This includes your power supplies. Plastic bags have a much larger environmental footprint than we can imagine. Majority of plastic water bottles end up in landfills or in the ocean, so it's always best for us to bring our own. from School of Hey, my name is Justin Chu. In accordance with achieving the Sustainability uh, Development Goals 2020, here are five ways to reuse glass jars featuring my brand, Pantan Kale.
um, these two participants have won, won basically um, 100 ringgit of e-voucher for their videos. And um, before I introduce the best questions, uh, prizes for the best questions, could we take a group shot? Um, uh, can I ask that you, that you turn your camera on and smile or just wave or something like that and my colleagues will take a picture. So we have Chia, Marion, yeah, can we, can, can everyone just turn your cameras on? Great, thank you for coming on. Hey, Rashwin. <laughs> All right, uh, one, two, three. Right, for the next group, uh, whoever is in the next page, I will take another picture. Hold on. Uh, so Chia's taking the picture. Right, one more, the next group. One, two, three. All right, thank you. Okay, so let me now um, introduce, uh, let me now um, introduce the best uh, question that we have um, e-vouchers for. And the best question goes to, uh Chia, Marvin. <laughs> okay, yes, so I have the winners here. Thank you, Justin. So the winners are Amina Shafana, Hudson Nyaki, and Mubashira Noor. So we so yay. So congratulations, and you are given, uh, you, are, you are presented with um, 30 ringgit um, e-vouchers from the courtesy of the Education Office um, in Monash University, Malaysia. Um, so I would just like to end um, today's session and the World Humanitarian Day by thanking all of you. Um, it's been a pleasure hosting you, and I hope you have learned uh, something and you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have and uh, thank you all once again and to our panel speakers thank you very much for being with us today I think um, you have given a lot to think about and a lot to reflect on in terms of education partnership and uh, how the next decade of action should be so thank you very much and I hope to meet, um, work with you all again sometime in the future and uh, have a really good World Humanitarian Day. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Uh, Thank thanks you. everyone.